So I've been requested to do a response several times on Vicky's argument on why capitalism is bad. Just have a listen to what she says here. Hello everybody, in this video I will tell you why I think that capitalism is bad and why it has to be replaced. There are many ways to approach this, one of them is equality. Capitalism is very efficient when it comes to creating a lot of wealth. Unfortunately, it's very bad at distributing that wealth. Pretty much all of the value the economy generates only benefits the top few percent of the population, that being their major shareholders. First and foremost, just understand that equality does not mean equal outcomes. Equality originally stood for equal opportunity. So in other words, it did not mean that people all earn the same income. However, you always hear this myth claiming that capitalism leads to this dangerous concentration of wealth in the hands of the few. Again, as I have pointed out several times before, and I had mentioned about the 19th century in the United States, between 1840 to 1900, wealth had remained the same. And of course, I had touched upon an argument uh, between the 1970s to the early 90s and what proved to be was that the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting richer faster. Now the biggest earners during the industrial revolution just so happened to be the poorest of society. Of course it was no different in Great Britain with the industrial revolution. We saw the poor dramatically improving in their wages and of course uh, they moved up the ladder. Again, it's really this case where they make these baseless, silly claims. They hope that people buy into it and no statistics, nothing. All you need to understand is, is that each decade, the bottom 20% moves up the ladder and then, of course, a new bottom 20% enters the market. The bottom 20% of people isn't fixed, it's not the same people each decade. Another approach would be waste of time. Capitalism actually doesn't produce as much stuff as it needs to produce. It makes way more, like up to 40% more. The reason for that is complicated, I have a video on that if you're interested. But take it that we all could work a whole lot less with the same pay if we stopped overproducing quite as much. It's this claim that capitalism will just use up the world's resources or capitalism is just wasteful and they use the example of food. Well, for example, in our previous video, through this of the subsidies, by the way, <laughs> in other words, socialism, you saw this food waste. Well, what's that got to do with capitalism? So I've already responded to our other video to do with that of the inefficiency. You can look at, for example, the 19th century, as I pointed out before, with John Davis and Rockefeller. He was utterly obsessed with efficiency. Of course, he was an accountant by trade and the other oil refinery companies were very wasteful. As more and more oil refinery companies would enter the market, there would be a greater supply and a greater output. So over the course of that decade in the 1860s, you would see the price of a barrel of oil drop by 50%. This would take a heavy hit on that of the other oil refinery companies and they were all going to go out of business. They were, you know, dumping about 40 to 60 odd percent of their crude oil. They were very, very wasteful. If you admit that the goal of a private business owner is to make a profit, how do you maximise your profits? Well, you maximise your profits by minimising your costs. If it costs you more to use more resources, then how do you maximise your profits then? You use fewer resources, you're more efficient. Just like that of Rockefeller, that's exactly what he did. Whereas in the argument Vicky's using, she's, you know, hypothetically speaking that if a company, you know, does exactly what those other companies do and it just you know, waste, then of course they'll just get away with it. That isn't the reality of a capitalist system. The capitalist system punishes such inefficiency and rewards efficiency. That's exactly what it was doing with the likes of Rockefeller, etc. It was rewarding success and punishing failure. Now, the system that you live under today is filled with all these government subsidies, etc. So it's only natural that you're going to face the inefficiency within private industry, because that's what happens when you have government subsidies, because there's no incentive for them to be efficient. We don't live under this capitalist system. This is where our entire argument falls apart. You're living under this system that rewards failure and punishes success, the opposite of way around from capitalism. Next is that capitalism isn't good at distribution of resources. In Europe and America, there is millions of tons of food waste every year, while 8 million people starve each year. 
And yeah, I can't blame that on capitalism, I have a whole video on that as well. So this argument is very similar to the previous. Basically, again, it's down to this whole thing to do with waste. But the bottom line is she doesn't understand the fact that, again, in order to maximise your profits, you must minimise your costs. Capitalists have no incentive to overproduce then face the possibility of losses because what happens if you overproduce a product, it's not selling. However, what I didn't address there, and again I've covered this numerous times before, you can watch my video on the economic calculation problem, she doesn't understand this argument. Watch my video explaining on profits and losses. The reason why it's so important that you understand that, there is nothing more important than the information of prices. If you don't hold the information of profits and losses, you don't hold uh, a variety of bits of information that require you to run things efficiently in the economy. In other words, you won't know how much to produce or even what to produce or where to allocate, etc. You've no clue because that's what the information of profits and losses gives you. Take food, for example, that she uses. She just thinks food is just food, right? As if it's just something collective. She doesn't understand that there's 65 million people. Everybody all has different tastes, right? So we don't all like the same food. And you're going to need to know, you know, how much to produce of each and every single, you know, food type. You know, it's not just a case that you've just got one food type, and even then you've got all the different variety of, you know, kinds of chicken. You've got the char-grilled, and you've got the normal chicken, you've got, you know, battered and all the rest of this stuff. It's the same with the fish, you've got the cod and the haddock, etc, etc. It's just like that of clothing or anything else, hundreds and hundreds and different options. You're going to need to know of how much to produce of each and every single option there is available. You don't know that information if you don't hold the information of profits and losses. That's the point. Again, she doesn't understand the economic calculation problem. Now, it's quite convenient that, because in the absence of profits and losses, as a very result of her socialist price controls, or even if they go down the road of the moneyless based economy, there's no information there to tell them how much to produce what resources to use, where to allocate them, etc, etc, and it ends up creating, you know, waste problems, and you see that through every single socialist economy. It's an erroneous argument, she just doesn't understand the economic calculation problem, and for why you're facing the waste today, again she describes corporatism, not capitalism. Next, capitalism promotes oligarchy. Since competition naturally leads towards monopolies, the market always ends up centralizing power among a few people. Those few didn't have more wealth and power than the rest of the population, which makes it a lot easier for them to bribe politicians or gain unfair advantages. It's not because of the freedom of the market that leads to this very problem of corporatism. Of course, between Abraham Lincoln's period onwards, for a good 50 odd years, you would see creeping corporatism. But you could look at the period of the robber barons, the myth of all the monopolies, etc., and bring in the argument on the antitrust law myths. Now, the real rationale behind the antitrust laws was basically that to protect the inefficient from the more efficient. So it never was about breaking up monopolies. After that of the antitrust law myths, of course the Sherman Antitrust Law Act in 1890, you'd begin to see more and more monopolies coming around in the, in the economy, one of which happened to be from a cartel. Again, all thanks to government's intervention, that being the American Medical Association, that was allowed to get away with a monopoly that then closed down all the medical schools, etc. That's what leads to all of these oligopolies these cartels, and that of to do with these monopolies. You could take, for example, again, the American Medical Association monopoly. Secondly, the cartel itself, that being the American Medical Association, or of course, the cartelization you saw of the private pharmaceutical companies that got away with shafting the consumer. But how were they able to get away with that? Because of the very issue of government's intervention, having created the third party payer system, that enabled that of these private pharmaceutical companies to get away with that in the first place. Again, it's because of the absence of the free market. It's not because of the free market, it's not the freedom of the market that leads to these problems. It's because of government's intervention, it's because of the opposite of the free market. It's actually the freedom of the market that prevents these monopolies and cartels from forming. It's due to consumer choice and fierce competition. That's the same story with that of the attempts throughout history 
with cartelization. Anytime there was an attempt for cartelization in the free market, what would end up happening is it would entice other competitors to enter that industry and they would then have the incentive to wipe the cartel out and that's exactly what happened. In other words, in order for a cartel to remain in place, it basically needs government's intervention because then government's intervention can maintain that cartel whereas if government's not there to protect them and it's down to the freedom of the market if you drive the the costs up etc it's going to entice other competitors to enter that industry why because it's profitable so you could, you could take for example the early 1860s when the oil refinery market was very profitable you know hundreds of companies were diving at the chance to you know, provide a service there because they knew they were going to make profits from it. However, as of course the higher output over the course of that decade uh, became less profitable as the price of a barrel of oil dropped by 50%. There's always the incentive for competition to enter the market and wipe out the cartel and that's what happens in the free market. She wants you to believe that this system you're living under today is somehow free market, something to do with capitalism and it isn't. Capitalism is also undemocratic. All of the decisions of what and how to produce and where to sell it and for how much are made mostly centrally by big corporations. The McDonald's management in the USA decides how much I have to pay for a cheeseburger in Vienna and I don't have any democratic control over that whatsoever. And all of those faults so far are just the obvious ones which I don't have to explain further. Again, she's really just speaking about that to do with the corporatist system. The capitalist system is to do with the free market, so it's actually the absence of competition. A prime example of that would be the collusion that the, you know, giant supermarkets in Britain were able to get away with and they're shafting the farmers and that is because they hold such dominance so they can actually demand farmers to lower their cost to you know sell to these supermarkets or the supermarkets will just say oh well if you don't provide us for cheaper goods then of course we'll just go to farmers abroad and we'll get it cheaper elsewhere. See this is the issue, they're getting away with shafting farmers in Britain because of a collusion that was able to form. But why was that collusion able to form? Again, government intervention. It's not the capitalist system. It's nothing to do with that of a free market. It's the absence of a free market. All the social security, the welfare statism, all the so-called free goodies, etc. The socialist fractional reserve banking, the devaluation of the currency. You know, her socialism in this economy has created a serious inflationary problem. We're faced with a debt crisis because of all our socialism that's been projected and tried to blame it all off into capitalism. Now we come to the more interesting one. Capitalism is just employers legally stealing from employees. Let me elaborate on that. This is a production process. This guy has a machine which takes in raw materials and outputs a product. But it has to be operated by someone and since this guy isn't gonna do it himself, he hires someone. Let's add some numbers. Our resources have a price of let's say 50, plus another 50 for rent and electricity as well as part of the initial cost of purchasing the machine. The worker works it and produces a product that has a value of 200. The employer then gives the employee 50 as a payment. Big deal, right? That's how it works, that's not what theft is, dislike. Okay, wait a second. Let's look at that work process again. We had 100 in initial costs, then the worker worked and we had a value of 200. Using basic maths, that leads me to conclude that the work the worker produced had a value of 100, because that's how much value he added to the product. So looking at the return and investment chart, it looks like this. The employer invested 150, of which 50 went to the worker and the rest went towards upkeep and raw materials. In return, he got a finished product with a value of 200. The worker on the other hand invested 100 worth of labor and received 50 in payment. So one of them got more than they invested and one got less. And if we keep going, we we'll realize that all of the profit this guy makes is value he didn't pay his employees. But of course, Vicky ignores the fact that in a capitalist system, capitalists are forced into a position of competing for skilled labor. Now, that's a type of you know, company that obviously produces goods. You have to be a skilled worker to produce specific goods. Now, if the company is producing goods, they have skilled labor, you're competing for skilled labor, 
that means it drives workers' wages up. So it's not a case that they get paid dirt poor wages, not unless of course you're in an entry level job, but that's an entry level job. At the end of the day, the worker, the employee, had the choice to go and work for themselves, or of course work for that company. She doesn't counter in the fact that if it costs £200 to produce, then the worker is going to sell that good off at a much higher price in order to make a profit from it. And of course, the more the company makes profits, the better the wages that the workers are going to get because they again have to compete to maintain their skilled workers. They can easily go and work for someone else. There's plentiful you know, employment opportunity in the marketplace. If she's arguing, if this is exploitation, what the bloody hell does she call the opposite of that? Getting rid of the private sector going down the road of a moneyless based economy and paying workers no wages to do hard jobs, to do jobs that would take up hours of work. That is exploitation. It's actually competition that limits that as much as possible. And at least in the capitalist system, they have the opportunity to go and do other things if that's the case. Whereas under socialism, what choice do they have? So that really is her argument in a nutshell, Falk. All you need to understand is that when you listen to socialists about capitalism, they've always got these baseless claims. Right? It's always the baseless claims and assertions. There's never any, you know, real evidence for what they speak of. It's a bit like saying that, oh, capitalism leads to the dangerous concentration of wealth into the hands of the few. Or capitalism means that only the few get to decide everything for everybody else, which just simply isn't true. Right? Again, and every time they speak about capitalism, listen to them carefully and you'll hear them speaking about that of the corporatist system. They're not even describing the capitalist system. In other words, what defines capitalism is the free market. They're not describing any free market. It's the absence of the free market. So, and they don't give you any historical examples because they can't. They're, they're incapable of doing so. And that's the entire problem. Again, you can check out several of my videos that I've pr provided on these arguments, especially on the economic calculation problem. And like I said, I mean, these people just come up with all these baseless claims. They throw it out there and they hope that it sticks. Well, there you have it. So I hope that's been educational enough for yourself. If you've got anything you'd like to add yourself or anything you'd like to ask, comment in the comment section below. And I'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you for watching and she'll talk to you later. Cheers.